Hello and welcome, welcome and thank you for tuning in to watch our candidates discussion for the writing of Burnaby South. My name is Corey Redderkop. I am the Director of Policy and Stakeholder Relations here at the Burnaby Board of Trade, the Chamber of Commerce of the City of Burnaby. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that uh, where I am here in our metro town offices, we're on the traditional homeland of the Hunkamanum and Skohomish speaking peoples, and to extend appreciation for the opportunity to hold this meeting on that territory. As the Chamber of Commerce for Burnaby, the, the Burnaby Board of Trade stands at the cross section of where business and community meet, and we work to foster and support a thriving, successful, and sustainable community for businesses, employers, and people. And to help our community get to know the local candidates in the ongoing federal election a bit better, the Board of Trade is holding these discussions uh, in each of the three Burnaby ridings, which are being shared to all in our community uh, uh, as you're watching right now. So we have extended invitations to all the candidates in each riding to participate, and I'm pleased to be joined by the following candidates for our Burnaby South riding today. We have Maureen Curran with the Green Party, Martin Kendall, an independent candidate, and Bria Sammy with the Liberal Party. So thanks so much for being here, everyone. Welcome. Thank to you. kick things off today, I'm going to go over the guidelines for our discussion. Candidates are going to be given two minutes to provide some opening remarks. Uh, that'll be in alphabetical order by last name when I introduce them. Following those opening comments, we're going to have a period of questions and answers with the candidates. These questions were developed uh, by the Board of Trade with input directly from our members in the business community here in Burnaby, and they're based on priority areas that we've been advocating at the, at the federal level uh, for many years. I'm going to direct the questions to each candidate, and I'll give each candidate up to a minute and 15 seconds to respond. We want to have a discussion and have a chance for everyone's thoughts to be, to be heard, um, as opposed to the debate. So the candidates have been asked to not interrupt or speak over one another's comments. Uh, now that we've covered the guidelines, I'd like to start with the opening remarks from our candidates. Uh, each will be given uh, the two minutes, and uh, Maureen, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, first, I'll just tell everyone a bit about myself. Um, I moved to BC about 30 years ago to study uh, nuclear physics and did a master's in science with UVic. And since then, I've been a teacher, math and science teacher, and working with SFU's teacher training program. I've lived in the Burnaby and New West area for over 15 years and raised my two boys here. Really love this community a lot. I've been involved in the community through mostly environmental organizations, but also, of course, through my kids in doing lots of work with, uh, whether it's Little League or building accessible playgrounds, I was heavily involved. I never really expected to get into politics. That wasn't my intention, but about a month ago, I was contacted by Elizabeth May and asked uh, to, put my name forward to represent Burnaby locally. And because of all the work that I've been doing, particularly with the Stop TMX movement, uh, trying to get politicians to pay attention to the science, to pay attention to the communities and the danger that these kind of projects pose, both short-term and locally, and of course in the long-term, um, I decided it was definitely time to step forward. Uh, we've just been putting up with COVID and we're still struggling through that and everyone knows that no one would trust a government that decided to shut down hospitals or fire nurses right now and yet this is what we're doing with regards to the climate change issues. We're increasing fossil fuel subsidies and infrastructure at a time when it needs to be shut down, when it needs to be taking and going in the other direction completely. So I care about this place just like you do. I love it here. I have sat in trees overnight for days on end to try and protect its green spaces, um, the salmon, the nature, and of course, a future for our children. So I hope you will be able to recognize that I care about the same things you do. I believe we can make Canada safer and better and healthier and more prosperous place for everyone. Perfect, thanks, Maureen. Uh, next, I'm gonna to move to uh, Martin for your two minute introduction. Martin, go ahead. Hi there, uh, my name is Martin Kendall. I'm uh, from Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada. I've lived here for over 20 years now. Uh, I'm married with two four-year-old children who keep me extremely busy. Uh, I ran in the municipal by-election earlier this year in June. Um, when the uh, snap election was called, I was asked by some of the people who voted for me and said, hey, why don't you run? You are actually a really smart guy. You're well-spoken. You have a Good moral background that you should uh, you should say what you what you would like to say on the on the federal uh, platform. So I decided to do so. Um, I think we're coming into a real crossroads when, as far as Canadians, we've got uh, housing prices which are through the roof right now. Climate change is not getting better, and global warming is becoming uh, unsustainable as a result of that. I, as I said, I do have two small children. 
I would like to look them in the eye in 50 years and say that I tried to do something to uh, to tame this. It, it's it's really really frustrating. I think that uh, you know I, I I'm 44 years old. I remember hearing about acid rain when I was a 10 year old and was absolutely freaked out about that uh, possibility. Uh, that being said, I, I just really want to give a Burnaby South a, a proper voice that deserves to be heard. I don't think any one party best represents my viewpoint. And as a result of that, I'd rather take the viewpoints of other parties and uh, take the best things out of them. I, I think the NDP has some good things. I think the Liberals have some good things. I think the Conservatives have some good things. And I think the Greens have some great things too. And I'd like to take all of them, put them all together in a melting pot. And I'd like to have something that works for everyone in Burnaby. Great, thanks Martin. And, and then uh, uh, Brea with the Liberal Party, you can go ahead with your introduction. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bria Huang Sammy. Um, I'm your liberal candidate for Burnaby South, of course. I'm a chartered professional accountant and immigrant and a working mother of three. I moved to Canada about 16 years ago and Burnaby was my first home. I live with my husband and our three young children here in Burnaby. We are all very proud to call Burnaby our home. Um, community service has been always my passion and I always been involved in there's no greater joy than um, helping a friend, helping a colleague, helping a neighbor. And the past 18 months have been really difficult for everyone. The global pandemic has been so close to our home. Um, in the meantime, I was so impressed that our liberal government have moved so quickly and brought in amazing support uh, to help our family, families and businesses go through this pandemic. The pandemic isn't over and the recovery will require a lot of hard work. And that's why I am putting myself forward to participate in our rebuilding and to serve and support our uh, home, to support my home community. And I'm here also because the great disappointment of our last MP, Jack Mead, who was constantly missing an action over the last two years, especially in a crisis time when our community needs help the most. Burnaby South needs a strong local voice, someone who truly understands our needs and concerns, and someone who actually cares about our community. I'm that person. I will be the real local voice that truly belongs to our community. And this pandemic has taken so much longer than we expected initially. We have suffered a lot and we have gone, we have gone so far. From here, I think the Liberal Party's plan is the, the one that will take us to the future that we want for our businesses, our family, and our children. And we cannot afford to vote for conservative, uh, conservative plan and go backwards. And we cannot afford to vote NDP and take a chance on those public numbers. We need to keep going. We need to keep moving on and this, with the solid Liberal plan. So um, with the re-elected Liberal government is fully committed to have your back with the most comprehensive, science-based, and most effective plan. We want to take strong actions on the recovery, recovery support, childcare, healthcare, climate change, and housing, of course, as well as making a equal Canada for everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So now that we have a chance to, to have, our, have, our, have had our introductions with the candidates, I want to dive into some of the, the, the questions here. And what we've done is, as the Board of Trade, we have 1,100 members representing uh, sectors across the, uh, the, across the city, uh, all types of businesses, all sizes of businesses. Uh, and, and when we look at an issue, we look at them with a bit of a broader perspective. Uh, we, we don't just look at the bottom line of business, we look at the triple bottom line and environmental and social uh, concerns as well. So I have questions that are tackling a, a wide range of, of topics here. You know, we'd love to get the, the thoughts and the opinions of our candidates on them. So uh, first I wanna start with obviously the, the biggest issue that we've been facing over the last two years, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the first question I will start, we're going to have a, a minute and 15 seconds for each person to respond. Uh, Maureen, I'll start with you on, on this one, but I'll, I'll move through the group as we go. So everyone will have a chance to comment on, on the questions here. Uh, so during the pandemic, the government support programs such as the wage subsidy and the commercial rent subsidy really have been lifelines for many Burnaby businesses. Do you have any thoughts on how those programs were rolled out so far? And what should the future of COVID support for business look like? 
very much. I do think um, I was really quite impressed overall with how well everything started on the whole COVID issue. I think there was uh, quite a bit of cross-party collaboration and uh, those supports that came out were essential. They came out relatively quickly too, and that was good. The problem I'm seeing now is that a number of them are about to be phased out and we're not out of COVID yet. It, we are still dealing with the pandemic and uh, individuals and businesses still need supports. It's too soon to cut it off. And in the long term, of course, we're going to start needing to phase in other things, which is part of the reason we're really strongly in favor of universal basic income um, and also looking at ways to support local businesses, um, especially seeing that we saw during, um, the, again, through during COVID that uh, big international corporations seem to do really, really well and local businesses were struggling. We need to provide more support to equal that out. Perfect. Thank you. Martin, I'll, I'll move to you. And the question is on your thoughts on the COVID uh, program for business thus far and what the future should look like. Well, uh, much like Maureen said, I was very impressed with the way the uh, federal government had dealt with the COVID uh, crisis at the beginning. I feel that they uh, did a good, pretty good job when it came to uh, rolling out CERB pay payments. And I feel that, uh, you know, the average Canadian was very well supported. Uh, on the business side, I was a little disappointed, especially as the uh, pandemic went on, that, uh, you know, I, I feel that a lot of the really big businesses took the money and, and basically gave themselves raises. They bought back stock and they, and they just didn't, they, they laid off people still. And that wasn't the deal. The deal was the money was supposed to go towards keeping people employed, keeping them off the eye and keeping them off serve. And I was extremely disappointed about that. And when this got exposed, you know, everyone talked tough about it. All four of the party leader, major party leaders, they all talked tough about this. They said, oh, that was bad. You shouldn't have done that, et cetera, et cetera. But there were no repercussions for that. And that was silly. Um, as we move forward, you know, it, it, unfortunately, COVID is going to be a large part of our life for the very, for the foreseeable future, honestly. We've got variants coming out, which are worse than the ones before. And we need to find a way to, you know, make our economy work with what we've got. You know, we've got the safeguards when it comes to COVID. We need to figure out how we're going to work with this. We have to live with it. We can't just, you know, cower in fear and, and say that, you know, the, you know, the sky is falling. We got to work. We got to move forward with this. I think that, you know, the federal government needs to move forward with funding for businesses that are, that are struggling with this. Uh, that being said, you know, if they, need, if they need a helping hand to move forward, yeah, I definitely think we should do that. But we need to be careful about that. We're spending way too much money. We've got a deficit that's absolutely enormous. I think it's $340 billion. So we need, we need to have some fiscal certainty when it comes to this. Great. Thank you, Martin. And then, uh, Bria, uh, your thoughts on the question, which is about how the programs for business were rolled out and uh, what the future should look like for COVID supports for business. Of course. Um, and first of all, I just want to say thank you to Maureen and Martin just uh, for recognition of all our great work that the federal uh, liberal government has done so far. It's a great um, encouragement for us and we know we are on the right track. And we we, we have been, we have always uh, put, um, have, Canadians back and our business back, and we'll continue to do so. And like you mentioned, when the pandemic hit, we have react we, we have react really quickly to make sure we provide sufficient support for individuals and businesses. So like our business will have well can stay open and uh, keep their workers on the payroll through these through programs like uh, wages subsidy, rent subsidy, and other support for other expense. And now we we still need to finish the fight. And it's more important now than ever to ensure that nobody left behind in our economy and um, economic recovery. And that's why we have a, a even bigger plan that we want to continue to support our business. For example, we're going to help business recover and support them to create more jobs through our Canadian Recovery Hiring Program. And all the existing program like sub, um, like the, the, the wage subsidy that were extended to March next year, we also looking into improving our EI. So people that were not initially eligible for EI, now they will get a coverage too. And we also boosting like new technology innovation economies. So I just have so much to talk about it. And um, we have more information in our platform. I would love to introduce, introduce more later. 
Perfect. Thank you. And, and uh, I'm going I'm to dig a little deeper on uh, a, a couple of the programs that a uh, few of you mentioned here um, and maybe have a different uh, after your thoughts on a different perspective. So during the depth of the pandemic, many Canadians relied on uh, individual benefit programs, not the one for business, but the individual programs such as the CERB, the extended EI and the more recent Canada recovery benefit. Speaking to our members in the business community, many feel that those programs may be overstaying their welcome and that they may now be undercutting the labor force by not encouraging people to return to work. What are your thoughts on the individual benefit programs and how do we balance supporting workers during the pandemic with the needs of our local business community in a place like BC, which now has recovered over 100% of the jobs lost? Maureen, I'll, I'll start with you again on this one. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, well, obviously, we're a party that's promoting uh, universal basic income or guaranteed livable wage. And so these are things that have been studied really well. And the idea of replacing all the different programs with one clear uh, program instead that's tied to what actually uh, is going to be a livable wage in that particular area is that it has been studied and it's been shown that it doesn't decrease the amount of people who want to work. What it does do, however, is provide local people in the econ like in the local economy with the money to be able to go and take part in local businesses, to be able to go and be the customers as well. So we're hoping that that kind of uh, feedback system is going to be able to really boost our, our local economies. We also do think that, yes, we have to manage it carefully because we don't want to be undercutting, you know, the situation and we want to make sure that local businesses are consulted and are part of that program so that they know that we are still supporting them. We want to make sure that their workers uh, do well where they're at and are happy where they are so they have all the supports they need um, in order to be able to thrive and flourish in our community. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, Martin, I'll move on to you on, on this question. Um, as, as I said earlier, when, you know, this pandemic came about, um, I, I thought the CERB was, was, was rolled out fairly in most cases. I know a few of my friends who did lose their job as a result of this, just due to cutbacks, and the, that their employers basically said, you know, we have to do this in order to survive. It, 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 was, it was very unfortunate. It was just it, the way it was. Uh, that being said, as as you mentioned earlier, you know we're getting into a, an, into a, a stage where things are are sort of coming back to normal. You know, uh, you know, eighty percent of the population of Burnaby has now been double vaccinated, um, and you know the, the economy for the most part has recovered. Uh, that being said, you know I don't think you know a majority of the population should be receiving CERB right now. I uh, really am disappointed that that is you know, still part of the equation. Um, but, you know, I, I think the business community needs to step up and realize that during this pandemic, that a lot of people who weren't making a lot of money, for example, just above minimum wage, like in the food service industries, realize that, man, why the heck am I doing this? Is that why am I busting my hump to make minimum wage, to get abused at work? And it's just, you know, we have to make working conditions better for the average workers that, you know, they don't get, they don't deserve the abuse at work and they deserve a proper wage where they can actually afford to live in, in the lower mainland. It's super expensive to buy housing here. It's super expensive for rental properties. So uh, I think we need to find a balance between the, between the business community and the governments when it comes to uh, serve. And uh, hopefully, as I said, we can move on and find a balance and, and move forward. Great, thank you, Martin. And Bria, your thoughts on the individual benefit programs and how we balance the needs of workers with the business community's needs. Yes. Um, so for the CERB, I think it was really a big, it, it's a big support for, um, for our um, families and individuals. And I have single, I have a friend who is, who, who is single mother with kids and it was really great help for her. Like, so when she lost her job last year, she was able to raise her kids um, without any significant impact. And I think CERB was, was important. Now, if you, you if you look closely, actually the federal government has been adjusting the CERB program, like it was no longer $2,000, it's been decreasing. And this one, we also, you will see like, we are looking into how the transition between the CERB and the EI system, EI, our ex existing EI system can have a smooth transition. Of course, like we are looking to like, we know as, as we go into the economy recovery, we want to make sure we have, um, uh, we, we are not facing um, like significant impact from the shortage of workforce. And we look into that in our plan, we actually, our, all our plan, we are focusing on creating jobs and um, make sure we have a supply of workforce in, the, in our economy. And for example, the childcare, 
when we um, when we when we cut down the cost uh, for childcare, when we reduce the cost for, for the childcare cost for family, there are more parents and more women they will have the um, ability to come out and work. And also the federal minimum wage is to protect the protect and encourage people to come out and join the workforce. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to move on from one crisis to another and talk about the, the climate crisis. Um, for many, the impacts of climate change were really brought into focus this summer. Uh, around the world, we've seen record floods, hurricanes, and named storms, and of course, the devastating wildfires here in BC. What do you think should be the focus for the next federal government in terms of addressing climate change and mitigating the impacts on people, the economy, and our communities? In this fight, where do we focus? Maureen, I'll start with you. Thanks so much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in order to be able to do a, a two for one here, we need to focus on a just transition. Uh, we should be um, doing the build back better idea. We have the resources. Unfortunately, they're going right now into massive subsidies for fossil fuel companies that are foreign owned and it doesn't help workers at all. Oil companies, in fact, have been divesting from our workforce. We've lost over 50,000 jobs in that industry and yet we still keep giving them more and more of our tax dollars. This is not a net benefit, benefit for Canada at all, and definitely not a net benefit for Burnaby, doesn't help us at least. We need to be building the kind of infrastructure that our children will need, not the stuff that's gonna be obsolete in five or 10 years. Um, and that means getting rid of TMX. That means uh, instead focusing on things like construction projects that will uh, retrofit homes, make things more energy efficient, that will uh, provide more transportation that is again more energy efficient and help businesses transfer themselves onto more energy efficient systems and also be part of the green economy. Lots of new um, uh, loans and uh, of course uh, support structures for them in doing that kind of work as well. I could go on but obviously I know I'm going to try and maintain the time limit doing my best here. Thank you very much and we'll keep going on it later. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, Martin, your thoughts on uh, where, where we need to focus uh, and uh, for the next federal government for the climate crisis? Uh, I, I think, plain and simple, we need to start moving away from fossil fuels. It, it's just, you know, we, we've been burning fossil fuels for, was it, 150, 200 years now. We know the evidence is, is that, you know, it's causing global warming, it's causing climate change, and it's becoming catastrophic, honestly. You know, we, we just had a summer where we had some of the hottest weather that we have ever experienced. And, you know, hundreds of people died because, you know, they basically didn't have air conditioning in their apartments. Or they, you know, they had no, it was just, it was ridiculous, honestly, that so many people in, an, in a first world nation died as a result of that. Uh, that being said, we need to, you know, move towards electric vehicles and we need to energize our you know our, our grid as a result of that the way we need to do this though is we do not need to build 20 million dollar 20 billion dollar dam sorry like site c that is not a sustainable way to go we don't it's first of all it's too expensive and it causes great a great deal of harm to our ecosystem and our environment it's just not the way to go we need to focus on Hydro, hydrothermal energy, we need to focus on solar energy, tidal energy, and we need to talk about nuclear power. We haven't talked about nuclear power for about 40 years because after Three Mile Island and that melted down, everyone says, no, 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 no. Nuclear energy is bad. It's not so bad if we use it responsibly. So we need to have a real conversation about that. Thank you, Martin. And Bria, your turn on this question. Thank you, Corey. Um, so yeah, like I guess, Everyone of us is still remember the extreme weather, the heat, and the the wildfire, the smoky days that we experienced this summer. It's a it, it's 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 a great warning for us. And climate change is the greatest threat that we are facing right now as a as a global community, Canadian community. And it is a great um, economic opportunity for us too. So, like for, for us, our liberal plan, we're focusing on. A couple of perspectives. One is we want to boost the green economy, create green jobs in our com communities across Canada, across the sector. We also want to encourage the, our people, um, um, encourage the use of uh, zero emission vehicles. And this will, will largely help to reduce the, um, reduce the pollution and help us cut the pollution and make sure um, we have a, make sure um, we have all our transportation sectors help to reduce the, the emission in our um, overall plan. And in the meantime, I appreciate Maureen mentioned that like, 
from now to, to, green, to, to the green economy is a transition process. So we still, we, we, st we, we need to get oil, oil gas sector, get them to involve and be part of our transition process. Make sure they are following our share goal, following more, rest more restrict um, standards that we pull out. In the meantime, from individual, we need to cut our, uh, we need to end our plastic waste. Everyone can be involved in that kind of pollution. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you all for, for this topic. And, and I was going to move on, but uh, Marie mentioned that we could speak forever on this. And I do feel that climate change is, is, is a real, uh, pardon the pun, hot, hot topic. And it, for 15 years, the Board of Trade has been, has been kind of leading, leading the Chamber of Commerce movement, at least, and trying to make more people look at this from a business perspective. So I, I want to ask one more question, maybe give you another, another minute and 15 seconds to, to dive a little deeper if you want on, on this topic. But in the record heat wave we had this summer, for example, we surveyed our businesses after that, and 25% of respondents said that they had seen ex uh, equipment failure during the heat wave, whether that was uh, HVAC systems that couldn't keep up, machinery that wouldn't work during the heat. Um, and it's a clear example in my eye of, of climate impacting business. But the challenge is many of the of, of businesses know they want to make a transition to green, greener uh tools, greener machinery, greener processes, um, but they also have payroll and cash flow challenges that make a nine-year payoff or a 10-year payoff a harder, harder thing to do, especially for small and medium businesses. Do you have any thoughts on what role the federal government should play in incentivizing and supporting businesses to make that transition um, uh, and, and helping them uh, move forward on, on green initiatives, green technologies, and, and, and things in their own business? Maureen, I'll, I'll give another minute and 15 back to you, and we'll go around here. Thanks. Yeah, we actually would like to establish a federally funded uh, green venture capital fund that would be supporting uh, viable small local green businesses startups and also supplement um, implementation of new clean technologies across all small and uh, mid-sized enterprises because we know that uh, one of the biggest things we can do to help local uh, economies become more green is actually make them more resilient and more um, less dependent on big global systems. One of the things that we've seen is of course um, when there's a crisis we often have supply chain issues and uh, uh, that sort of thing as well. So that those sorts of things are major. My son works at a local store that had to shut during COVID. Um, sorry, uh, so not just during COVID, they had to shut during the heat wave because it was not safe for them to work there. We know that the costs to businesses right now are going to just keep escalating, insurance costs going up and so on. So the federal government has to act faster on transitioning off of fossil fuels and pretending that building a pipeline is going to fund that is ridiculous and totally wrong. Um, you, it's like buying a donut store to be able to go on a diet. It makes no sense at all. So uh, that's where we have to be spending our money, not on um, propping up the oil companies. They've had enough of our funds already. It's time to cut them off and fund it, our actual workers. Great. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Martin. Uh, I, I agree 100% with Maureen when she's talking about ending subsidies for the, for oil, for the oil companies. They have definitely had more than their fair share. Um, I know in British Columbia, their fund, their you know subsidies are actually supposed to go up in the next ten years. It's, it, you know what? If you can't do business in Canada without a, you know, large amount of subsidies from the government to do that, then maybe you need to change your business. It's just not, it's just not going to work. Um, I would rather see the Canadian government investing in small to medium sized Canadian businesses and making sure that these kind of things come around. You know. They, you know, they turned around and they gave $12 million to Gail and Weston and, and uh, you know, people who run great Canadian superstores so they could get more efficient fridges. They didn't need the money. Give that money to the guy at the corner store who's, you know, been there for 50 years and has a fridge that can't, you know, take it anymore and, and, and buy him something new that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna work and be energy efficient. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be an ongoing challenge that, you know, a lot of older buildings don't have proper HVAC systems. It's uh, COVID's affected that because, you know, if you don't have proper HVAC systems, you can spread the virus that way. As well, if you don't have proper AC, if it goes up to 40 degrees again, you're going to have to shut down and probably, and, you know, if you shut your doors, you can't do business as a result of that. Um, I, I just would like the government to have the right priorities for hardworking Canadians. And then, you know, once that happens, I, I think, you know, we, we just, I think Maureen was 100% correct. We just need to stop giving subsidies to the big oil and gas companies. Great, thank you, Martin. And uh, Brielle, I'll let you in on this question uh, uh, on uh, supporting the business community to transition. Uh, yes, um, like 
So I would like to take a different perspective, um, a more realistic perspective. Yes, Canada is an energy rich company and our economy largely depends on large, large, um, large companies, medium companies and small companies. We all end this as a business com communities. It's not realistic to say, okay, we are going to bring transition, we shut it down completely right now. The, 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 the gas is still going to be the, a big part of the world global energy consumption mix. So for us to, to, to continue to, um, to make sure the transition is smooth and make sure that um, like our um, existing sectors, they are following the very uh, strict standards as part of, is part of, it's very critical part of our transition to look to a zero emission. But in the meantime, in the meantime, you will see all, all the profit that we earn from um, current economy, we are focusing on in a small business, a medium business. You will see just to, on the topic that uh, Corey just mentioned about like the um, ventilation um, conditions in this extreme, extreme weather this summer. The liberal government and the federal government has put out um, support programs to help everyone, help the business individuals to retro retrofit, to upgrade the to upgrade your system to uh, green green products. We also uh, we are supporting indoor vaccination and to improve the air qualities. So there are a lot of projects that we are focusing, like we can improve the environment for our workers and our businesses. Thank you. Priya, thank you all for, for your, your thoughts on that topic. Um, another, another issue that uh, is a top concern for Burnaby businesses, big and small, is the cost of housing. For them, they see its impacts on the labor force as it becomes harder to find workers as they have to live further afield. And those that uh, can live here need higher wages to afford the housing. For us, uh, a, a big priority for the Burnaby Board of Trade is the middle ground of, of housing, support for working class, middle income people um, who are often in, ineligible for many of the existing supports because of their income levels, but are not able to, to uh, compete in, in the, the market at, at full value. Uh, and they're often left behind in housing conversations. What do you think can or should be done uh, to, to address housing affordability challenges in Burnaby and the lower mainland overall? And how do we, how do we address housing for the, the, the labor force housing, for the working, the working people in our economy. Uh, Maureen, we'll come back to you on this one. Thanks very much. Um, so obviously we know that there are uh, significant issues with things like vacancy rates uh, and also with uh, speculation. So we think that there's a lot of regulation that needs to happen in order to be able to uh, reduce that because homes should be being built for people, not for someone else to be making a ton of money off of it. That's not the point of housing. So we need to take a little bit more control of that market and make sure that it is actually tuned to help the people. We know that when uh, there's been, well, a massive amount of uh, money laundering through real estate and that needs to be investigated and shut down. We know that there has also been um, a lot of pressure to, because of low interest rates and so on, to build these big fancy condos. And again, not everybody can afford those. So we need to be doing the sorts of things. I think that honestly providing affordable housing um, is going to help the market in general, but also providing national rent control and looking at uh, in-between measures to help all the different stages uh, be supported properly. There um, has been I guess the, the renovations and so on that were happening in Burnaby, I think were a travesty. I'm really glad that municipalities working hard on that and we need to support them in their work. That's the federal job is not to get in there and do the work, but to make sure that the people who are doing it get the funds they need. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, Martin, your thoughts on, on the housing affordability? Um, well, you, you know what, I'm, I'm a, when it comes to this, I'm, I'm one of these middle class guys who uh, lives in a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment with my wife and my two kids. And we outgrew this about this place about five years ago. Um, we were, we've been looking for about the last three to four years to move on somewhere else in Burnaby. Uh, my wife works for the city of Vancouver and I do as well. So we don't really want to go out into the suburbs into more in Maple Ridge or anything like that. Um, and it, it's become extremely hard to even find a place that's in our price range to tell you the truth. Um, what I think we need to do is that, as I mentioned earlier, that the, uh, you know, I, I don't think the federal government should be putting billions of dollars into new supply 
until the municipalities rewrite their zoning bylaws. There's got to be a lot more flexibility and, and an emphasis on general, general gentrification in single family household uh, communities. Um, that being said, when the supply does come online, it's got to stay in the hands of hardworking Canadian families. It cannot go to millionaires, it cannot go to corporations, it cannot go to foreign buyers. I think foreign buyers need to be shut out of the process for the next five years, to tell you the truth, and possibly forever. You know, there's countries around the world like Australia and New Zealand who have done this, and it has shown that the supply goes up, the prices go down. This is what we need in Canada. Housing is way too expensive, rent is way too expensive, and you know, everyone's losing in this one. Um, we, we just need to do better. Thank you, Martin. And Bria, your thoughts on housing affordability? Of course, yeah. So um, I do agree. This housing price crisis is not just um, it's not just a surprise. And that's why, if you look at our labor plan, we don't not only look at a, look, looking at a surprise. On the surprise side, we are not just building; we're building re, uh, repair and refit like empty office space to a livable residential space. So more people will have more options. And most more housing unit will be available for for will be available and accessible by our by our residents. And in the meantime, we are helping um, like people like just uh, Jeff Martin just mentioned our middle class people. We help you. We we, we will set up a tax free um, first time home buying account that you can get up to forty thousand out tax free, and will help to reduce the mortgage interest. Will even help have a renter to become an owner through the rent to own program. In the meantime, we know like the spec speculation transaction does play a part in this housing market. And we are going to, um, we're going to, we're going to put a lot of effort to elim eliminate it. In the meantime, we want to make sure when you real, when, when buyers like, like us, like when we go into the housing market, our legal rights are protected. Uh, so you will see, we are looking into the whole crisis and looking into all the pinpoints, make sure we address them. Great, thank you. I think we have time for, for one more question. I'm gonna pick one that kind of cuts across all, all, a whole bunch of topics here and that's the cost of living and inflation. Uh, inflation in Canada was up 3.7% year over year in July, which was the biggest increase in a decade. Uh, for our businesses, they're seeing the cost of their inputs and the raw materials going up. And in turn, then the cost that they charge to consumers must increase too. And as costs to consumers increases, that puts downward pressure on discretionary spending and upward pressure on wage costs for business. Are you concerned about inflation and the general cost of living in Burnaby? And what would your message be to voters who are finding the cost of everyday life just going up and up? Maureen, I'll start with you. So yeah, I, I do agree that, I mean, obviously housing is one of the biggest ones. So if we address that, that's going to put a lot more um, money out of people's you know, budget back into being able to afford other things. Um, so that's that's a big one. We've also seen wages stagnate. And so we definitely need to be looking at ways to uh, promote and encourage higher minimum wages and so on, because clearly what we have now is not affordable. Um, I look and compare, for example, the house, you know, the little condo I bought is the same cost as the place my dad lived in. Um, but when he was uh, also a teacher and his wage is almost the same as mine, even though that was like 30 years ago. So these sorts of things need to be addressed. And we, need, we do think that the UBI is going to help with a lot of that too. It gives, again, a lot more local people a chance to buy um, what they need. And uh, we also think that fostering local economies and keeping local economies more uh, diverse and more robust is going to be a big help as well because we'll be less impacted by global changes. And we know that with climate change, global disasters and so on hitting in certain supply chains are going to cause massive problems. Uh, so those sorts of things have to, we have to be more resilient um, and able to deal with those sorts of things. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Martin, I'll move on, on to you for this one. Uh, I think when it comes to house prices and all that kind of thing in Burnaby is that it's insane to tell you the truth. Um, I really think interest rates need to go up soon. We've been, you know, when it comes to Keynesian ex economics, which I know nobody listens to anymore, you know, when inflation goes sky high, you're supposed to put your interest rates up. That's how you keep this in, in check. Um, the government and the, and the Bank of Canada haven't been willing to do that. Governments around the world are basically, you know, replicating the same trend. It is, it is what it is, but I, I think that, you know, they need to look at it. Um, at the same time, you know, the reason, the, the way that, Housing prices will come down is we need more supply for the average Canadian family. 
Um, when we build supply, it's got to stay out of the hands of, you know, big, big, big companies, millionaires, and foreign, and foreign buyers. It has to be bought by hardworking Canadian families who basically are falling behind every month because they pay so much of their rent out of their income and, and aren't getting ahead as a result of that. They're building no equity for themselves in their future. Um, as far as the inflationary part of it, yeah, I, I feel it really intense. I have two kids and they're eating more every single day. And, uh, you know, my wife comes home four or five times a week and just remarks on how much, you know, four bags of groceries, it's costing way more than it did last year or the year before. Um, we, we, need, we need to control this. And the interest rates, I think, is the number one way that we're going to start, you know, taming inflation. Thank you, Martin. And uh, Bri, I'll, I'll, you'll wrap up our last question here on inflation. Uh, I'll give you your minute and 15. Go ahead. Of course. Yeah. So when we're facing inflation, like the couple of things that we need, we can look at the macro, um, macro level, we can look at the micro level. Of course, the surprise is issue, but at the meantime, supply, when the supply kick in, in the meantime, the our liberal government, what we, what we are looking at is how can we help people how can we help our community, our families will be able to pay to afford the bills right now, right away? So during the last year and a half, you'll see we have been giving one-time payments uh, to, to, to families with kids just to cover up the, the extra cost they have to pay for the groceries, grocery bill. And we pay one-time payment to the seniors so they could afford that. Um, but in the meantime, if you're looking at long-term going on, it would if the elected, like the elected government will also looking into how we can roll our federal minimum wage of $18. In the meantime, our front frontline workers, we are, especially the personal support workers, we are looking into um, increasing their um, wage to $25. And in the meantime, we want to make sure that our family have more money. For example, we are going to put additional $500 for each individual seniors so they can they have the money to pay for the bill right away. The parents, why we are looking at housing, we are looking at child care, you will pay less than that, you have more money. We also looking into create good jobs. So our families and parents will be able to have, earn more and have more money in the pocket to cover that. Thank you, Bria, and, and, and thank all of you, Maureen, Martin, Bria, thank you so much for joining us today for this insightful and, and important discussion with our local candidates. It's important that, that uh, uh, residents and businesses have a, have a chance to hear what the thoughts of our candidates are, so we appreciate you taking the time today and for putting yourselves forward uh, as candidates in the federal election. Public service is an important part of our society, and you should all be commended for, for stepping up and being willing to help in, in, uh, in that space. Um, for those of you watching, I encourage everyone to get out and vote. Uh, you can vote at your assigned polling station on election day now, which is Monday, September 20th. The polls will be open for 12 hours on election day. Uh, for more information on, on how to vote, you can visit elections.ca or call 1-800-463-6868. Thanks, everybody.